In this video, we're going to take a brief look at trademark law and see how trademarks have evolved into what they are today. Trademark law is a very interesting subject, but we're not going to go into it in very much detail. We'll consider in a little while how trademarks evolved into a property right. But there's certainly no doubt that trademarks are valuable. Here we can see the most valuable trademarks in 2016, as determined by Forbes magazine. Now we're not talking here about the value of the companies and all of their assets. We're only talking about the value of the trademark alone. Which do you think was the most valuable trademark in 2016? That's a little while ago, but I imagine not an awful lot has changed. Which do you think it is? Well, it was one of these. Here's the top five. Well, it turned out to be Apple. So Forbes estimated that the value of the Apple brand, now just the brand, was $154 billion. Now Apple as a company has other assets like factories and cash, but the brand alone was worth $154 billion. So clearly trademarks are very valuable. So a trademark is a sign that can distinguish the goods of one undertaking from another. And that ability to distinguish is crucial. But what can be a sign? That's quite a, a difficult question to answer. But typically a trademark is a word or a logo or some graphic device. But the law is expanding in this area and increasingly other kinds of signs are being allowed. To fully appreciate and to fully understand modern trademarks and how they work, we have to consider the history of trademarks just a little bit. Schechter's Historical Foundations of the Law Relating to Trademarks is still the best history we have today, despite being almost a century old. This was published in 1929, but the author died quite young. And so as we've seen from our look at copyright law, this is now in the public domain. So if you're interested in trademark history, this is a really great place to start. We're going to consider just some of the key milestones in the development of trademarks. And what we're interested in is the arc in the, in the journey the trademarks have made from their earliest origins to what we have today. Where goods were purchased close to where they were made, it was easy to know where they came from. This close relationship between the purchaser and the maker acted as a guarantee of quality. But as goods were increasingly produced far from where they were sold, more sophisticated systems of quality control evolved. Although they developed in different industries at different times and in different ways, they had a lot in common. In the past, many professions were regulated by guilds. A guild was an association of craftsmen or merchants that regulated a particular area of the economy. Typically, each guild had a monopoly on a particular area. These guilds operated apprentice schemes, for example, and resolved disputes between members. One of their key functions was to ensure the quality of goods sold by members of the guild. Shoddy practices could have brought the entire guild into disrepute so some guilds required members to mark their wares. This allowed substandard goods to be traced back to their makers so they could be punished. And so the earliest marks were for traceability. Importantly, though, they were liabilities, not assets. One of the earliest recorded requirements to mark goods was a law from 1267, that required bakers to mark their bread with some sign. Typically, this was a pattern of pinpricks. Quality was especially important for valuable goods. 
In 1355, silversmiths in France were required to mark their wares, and a similar requirement was introduced into England in 1363. There's a record from 1365 of cutlers in London being required to mark their products. Any knives offered for sale without a mark were confiscated. But again here the purpose was to be able to trace back inferior products to their makers so that they could be punished for harming the reputation of the guild. But as individual makers' marks started to become associated with high-quality products, they evolved from a liability to an asset. This happened first with cutler's marks. There's a record from 1452 of a widow seeking to use her late husband's mark. Presumably it had developed such a reputation that it was valuable. Family members were often permitted to use a mark after the death of the person to whom it originally belonged. Eventually, it became an asset that could be transferred from one person to another, like property. Makers' marks developed in a similar way in many other industries too. Having started out as a liability, over time the mark became an asset. Because marks were signifiers of origin and guarantors of quality, the law became interested in their misuse. Deceiving customers with fake marks was clearly fraud and was obviously punishable. But the law recognised quite early that fake marks harmed not only the deceived consumer, but also the original manufacturer whose mark was used. His reputation was likely to suffer as a result of the mark being used on inferior products. The earliest case we know of is from 1584. It involves a mark fixed to cloth. Sandforth used GJ and a tucker's handle as his mark. Now, nobody knows anymore what a tucker's handle looks like, but Another manufacturer used the same sign on his cloth with the intention of benefiting from Sandworth's reputation. The courts recognised the harm not only to the customers but also to Sandforth. Skipping ahead over a century, we have a newspaper ad from 1703 in which Ephraim Howe is warning potential customers that someone is selling knives with a mark that is confusingly similar to his own. His mark was a heart and a crown and the letters H-O-W. But someone was selling knives with a spade and a crown and the letters N-O-W. So this shows us that even a long time ago, marks were considered valuable assets and their unauthorised use was a problem for manufacturers that had a good reputation. From 1742, we start to see the emergence of modern case law. Blanchard v. Hill involved playing cards, and an injunction was granted to stop the fakes being produced. Sykes v. Sykes was an interesting case from 1824, because it was clear in this case that the retailers who were selling the fakes were under no illusions as to what they were selling so they had not been fooled. But the court found that there was harm being done to the original manufacturer nonetheless. And in a case in 1833, the original manufacturer wasn't even required to show that he suffered any actual harm. So the common laws surrounding the use of trademarks evolved into the modern-day tort of passing off. Passing off occurs when a manufacturer misrepresents his goods as those of another manufacturer, usually because the other manufacturer has a better reputation than he does. Importantly, however, 
it's a crime against the manufacturer, not the potentially deceived customer. And that's an important distinction. Now, as we know, common law isn't always written down in statute. And all we might have to go on is case law. The Diplock test for passing off was articulated in 1915 in Spalding Brothers v. A.W. Gamage. In this case, Lord Diplock set out the necessary criteria for a finding of passing off. There had to be a misrepresentation by a trader in the course of trade to customers calculated to injure the business or goodwill of another trader. If it wasn't calculated, then it at least had to be a foreseeable consequence of the actions taken. And furthermore, it had to cause actual damage to the business or goodwill, or be likely to do so. Now, the Diplock test was a bit onerous. It was difficult to demonstrate intent, and harm to the business could sometimes be difficult to identify. In the intervening years, the test has evolved into what is known as the classic trinity for passing off. And there are three parts to this. So for passing off to occur, there must be the goodwill of the claimant. So the claimant's product must have a reputation. If it's brand new or no one has ever heard of it, for example, it would be difficult to demonstrate this. There must be a misrepresentation made by the defendant. And finally, there must be some consequential damage. Goodwill is quite difficult to define. It's quite elusive, but it's tied up with reputation. If there are people out there aware of a product and they think well of it, then there is goodwill. Through marketing and advertising, it might be possible for a product to have goodwill even before it goes on sale. But of course, if you're talking about a mark that no one has ever heard of, well, it's difficult to demonstrate goodwill there. Interestingly, you can have goodwill even in places where you don't operate. Decades before CNA opened a store in Ireland, it was involved in a case against a retailer in Waterford. Even though it had no shops in Ireland, the court found that because of advertising and exposure to the brand in the UK, CNA did in fact have a reputation in Ireland. What is misrepresentation? Well, the law refuses to be drawn on specifying exactly what is required for a finding of misrepresentation. Lord Parker pointed out that you couldn't enumerate them all and that that was probably a wise finding. It certainly doesn't require the production of convincing copies of products. They just have to be similar enough to fool some people. And how many people are confused and what kind of people are confused? These are precisely the issues that come up in passing off cases. But possible deception is always assessed from the point of view of the relevant public. That's the people who would actually be in the market for products. So vegetarians would not form part of the relevant public for a passing off case involving beef burgers, for example. Unless, of course, the claimant's burgers were veggie burgers. In a case of passing off, there doesn't need to be intent. The misrepresentation doesn't actually have to be deliberate. There's no need to demonstrate that it is. Having said that, accidental cases of passing off are rare enough. The court will assess the extent to which the relevant public was likely to be confused. There's no requirement to find people that were actually confused. But of course, if you can track some down, that really helps. The claimant must show that damage has occurred or is likely to occur as a result of the misrepresentation. This can be complex, but not difficult. It's often an estimate of lost sales, for example. Now, for an action of passing off to be successful, 
the offending product needn't be an exact copy. It just needs to be enough to confuse consumers. Let's look at an example. So on the top here, we have Bishop and Castle luxury chocolates. Might someone go into a shop with the intention of buying Bishop and Castle chocolates and come away with the package below? Well, I, I think they could. I think this could constitute a misrepresentation. But of course, the problem here with this example is that I just made up Bishop and Castle chocolates. There's no goodwill there. There's no reputation. Let's look at some real-life examples of possible cases of passing off. Here, Boots is making its second appearance in this module. Does Head & Shoulders have goodwill? Does it have a reputation in the marketplace? It definitely does. Does the packaging of the Boots shampoo constitute a misrepresentation? Might someone think they were buying Head & Shoulders? It's certainly close, isn't it? If the court found that this was the case, then the next question would be, was there damage caused? That wouldn't be difficult to demonstrate. Each bottle sold, for example, represents a loss to the company that sells Head & Shoulders. Here's another Boots product on the left. The packaging and the name are quite similar to the brand on the right. Here, the branded vinegar is the one on the left called Sarsen's. That's well known in the UK. The one on the right, Samson, was sold by a supermarket. The packaging is very similar, and so is the name. Which magazine found that 40% of people surveyed incorrectly identified it as a bottle of Sarsen's? That's a very high number. The most important passing off case in the UK was the Jif Lemon case. This case went all the way to the House of Lords. One issue here was that it doesn't seem unreasonable to put lemon juice in a plastic lemon. If an established brand of whiskey, for example, was selling whiskey from a plastic lemon, then an attempt by anyone else to do something so unusual would clearly be calculated to benefit from that brand's goodwill. But selling lemon juice in a plastic lemon is not an especially distinctive or unusual thing to do. However, the House of Lords concluded that over many years, Rickett and Coleman had persuaded the public that lemon juice sold in plastic lemons was manufactured by the company. The most important passing off case in Ireland was McCambridge v Brennan and that went all the way to the Supreme Court. McCambridge had a very successful whole wheat bread. Brennan sold whole wheat bread in packaging that the court found to be similar. Importantly, the court found that it was not any one single thing that constituted the misrepresentation, but the overall get-up, the overall impression, the plastic packaging, the green colour, the font, the overall combined effect of all of these was enough to constitute a misrepresentation. There was even some evidence introduced that suggested this might even have been deliberate. But of course, it didn't need to be deliberate for the passing off to have occurred. Interestingly, McCambridge was able to provide evidence of actual people who went in to buy McCambridge's bread but came out with Brennan's bread by mistake. So we can see that over time, Maker's Marks developed from a liability to an asset. And with the tort of passing off, the law recognises that the misuse of someone's mark, or something like it, is a kind of fraud that not only harms the customer, but also the original manufacturer. Prior to 1860, the law was primarily concerned with this fraud. The court's interest in protecting marks was firmly rooted in the prevention of fraud. But from the 1860s onwards, the courts began to 
see trademarks as a kind of property. This was a big shift. In Edelstein v. Edelstein, the judge noted that the court was acting to protect the plaintiff's property rights. This decision, and others like it, took trademarks out of the realm of fraud and into the domain of property. And in a similar case in the same year, the court again considered trademarks to be property, and the case was decided on the protection of property rather than the prevention of fraud. Now, where a manufacturer's mark is being abused, an action for passing off is a remedy. But it's quite cumbersome. It's expensive, and it might be difficult to establish that all of the criteria have been met. The difficulties encountered by manufacturers in protecting their marks, and in particular protecting them abroad, led to the development of trademark registers. France was the first country to introduce a trademark register in 1857. So a manufacturer using a mark was able to register that mark with the government and it was recorded in a public register for all to see. Trademark registers offered a number of advantages. Where there is a register, it's very easy to know who owns which marks. The registered owner of a mark can be presumed by the law to be the person authorised to use it. An honest manufacturer can check the register before using a mark to make sure it's not already in use by someone else. Importantly, however, the use of a register allowed for a separate body of law distinct from the law of passing off. Special laws governing the use of registered trademarks could be developed. In 1862, John Arthur Roebuck introduced a bill to establish a trademark register in Britain. He was the MP for Sheffield, where there was a lot of demand for such a register, and it became known as the Sheffield Bill. Manufacturers were well protected at home, but they enjoyed little protection abroad. It was noted in the debate on the bill that, within the last month, one of his constituents had been addressed by a Prussian manufacturer to the following effect. I will make for you an article of hardware with any Sheffield mark you please. You only have to send it to me and tell me what mark you wish to have put on it. Not only will I do this, but I shall put the article in a wrapper of the Sheffield manufacturer or one so like it that nobody can perceive the difference. The desire for a register was motivated principally by a need to enter into reciprocal arrangements with other countries to protect marks. And this was made very clear in the debate. It was argued that the bill sought to give effect to a law of reciprocity between ourselves and other nations, so that if another country protected English manufacturers abroad, we should protect theirs at home. And that, as an Englishman might register his name in a book of registration, so might a foreigner, who would then be entitled to the protection which the former enjoyed. It being made a sine qua non, that there should be complete reciprocity. So here we can see the reciprocity being the main motivation for the introduction of a register. And this was very clear from the debate. Our countrymen suffered very much by these practices in foreign countries. And when they complained, the answer they received was, you do nothing to protect us in your country. There must be reciprocity. If you would give us a remedy, we would most willingly listen to your complaint. In the end, the Sheffield Bill didn't pass. Most MPs felt that there was no need for a register and that the law already protected marks sufficiently. The Merchandise Marks Act of 1862 criminalised the imitation of marks. 
we can see then that at this time, trademark law was still very much focused on the misuse of marks being a type of fraud. There's reluctance to embrace trademarks as a kind of property. Trademark registers did take off elsewhere, however, and other countries quickly followed the example of France. The Australian colonies were among the first, with South Australia setting up a register in 1863. Australia wasn't yet the federation it is today. Eventually, the UK set up a register in 1875. The first trademark was for Bass Ale. It's still trademark number one on the register today. So with the passing of the Trademarks Registration Act, trademarks were well and truly recognised as property. And this brings us to pretty much where trademarks are today. So marks began as a quality control measure used by guilds. And the individual maker was identified so that he could be punished if he produced shoddy goods. In time, the marks of makers who enjoyed a good reputation came to be assets. And the law recognised these assets and sought to prevent fraudulent misuse of them. But over time, marks evolved from being a communication to being a thing. Marks increasingly came to be recognised as property. And the establishment of registers formalised this view of trademarks. Nowadays, there is a separate body of law covering the misuse of registered trademarks. However, in common law jurisdictions, the old tort of passing off still remains and is still in use. But for many owners of marks, the fact that the trademark is registered as being owned by them makes its protection much simpler. <laughs>